Hello everybody, welcome and thank you for joining us online. I'm Natalie Teitner, I'm the manager of the Jerwood Compton Poetry Fellowships and I'm very pleased to be joined by our current fellows, Yomi Shode, Hafsa, Anila Bashir and Anthony Joseph. Um, this is the second of our poetry roundtables. Uh, the first one was fantastic with the poets discussing the things, the art that kept them going during lockdown. It's available online at Jerwood Arts and I would definitely recommend that you go and check it out. Uh, today, we're gonna to be discussing something a little bit different. The poets are gonna be reading their own work, which is incredibly exciting. And then they're gonna have hopefully a very fascinating discussion about poetry, process and politics. For those of you who've only just learned about the Jerwood Compton Poetry Fellowships, they're a significant new development opportunity for poets and they support individuals whose practice encompasses poetry in the broadest artistic sense. The Jerwood Compton Fellowships are designed and managed by Jerwood Arts with support from Arts Council England including funds from the Joseph Compton bequest. For September and October 2020, we've invited the Jerwood Compton Poetry Fellows to take over the Jerwood Arts channels. The fellows joining me today are celebrating the end of a year of mentorship, reflection and development through the fellowship program with this new digital program of online events, content and social media takeovers. So again, you might want to check into Jerwood Arts because some of the events are now up online, including Yomi Shuri's amazing piece on uniformity. Um, and we're going to be adding various new pieces very soon, including Anthony Joseph's um, live music poetry performance, um, Sonnets for Albert, which will be going up on Saturday, the 17th of October. Before we get into the discussion, I wanted to take a few moments to introduce each of the fellows. Hafsa Anila Bashir is a Manchester-based poet, playwright and performer, originally from East London. She's currently developing new work for the Teta Tet Festival and has recently launched the Amazing Poetry Health Service, a project delivering poetry panaceas by the people for the people. Anthony Joseph is a Trinidad-born poet, novelist and musician. He's the author of four poetry collections and three award-winning novels. As a musician, he has released seven critically acclaimed albums and in 2020 received a Paul Hanlon Foundation Composers Award. Yomi Shode was born in Oyo State, Nigeria and lives in London. He's been performing poetry for over 10 years. Highlights include opening for Saul Williams and The Last Poets with appearances at Yahoo, Wireless Festival, Latitude, Lovebox, Olympic Village, Sadler's Wells Theatre, and also working with Channel 4 and BBC Radio 1 Extra. Yomi founded Boxed Inn in 2012, a quick fire free poetry night in Box Park in Shoreditch, which is doing great work to increase the diversity and inclusivity of British poetry. So I think we'll begin. Uh, Hafsa, are you happy to read your work first? Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Um... So the piece that I'm reading is actually a monologue um, and it speaks to our family history. So um, it's called Spirits of Sanam and uh, reflects my grandmother's experience of the 1947 partition of India. The Spirits of Sanam. 70 years is a long time waiting to be heard. People ask me all the time, what do you remember, Sarvini? Everything, I tell them. As a child in India, I remember merchants would bring their best wares specially to our house. Fine jewellery, exquisite ornaments, plush selections of fabric, bright yellows, fuchsia pinks, petrol blues and crimson reds to choose from. Sometimes I'd seen, see Mim Sahibs, the English women, in their long layered dresses decorated with silk brocades, tiny corsets pil pulled in tight at the waist. I had the best sandals in Sanam, but still wanted their heeled leather shoes, even though I knew that nothing they wore was suitable for our hot weather. But I was a child. I had no real understanding that everything we had that was of no value to the Raj was considered inferior. My father, Atta Muhammad, worked for the British as a senior police officer, and our Havili was the greatest house in Sanam, our village. Though my father was loving, he was also strict. 
Askari, my sister and I would sneak out to the markets without him knowing. And the maids would cry out, your father will get angry. But we would duck and dive past them, giddy at the chance to mix with villagers. We loved adventures, but really most of all, we just wanted to be boys. My younger brothers, Alam and Sultan, played in the cotton field surrounding the Havili, and those fields stretch for miles. How we feasted on the harvests, fresh sag with pure makan, a taste nobody forgets. When talk of the partition happened, our father refused to believe it. I remember I was 17. Our family in Bombay sent us news that killings were widespread and warned us it would happen in Sunam too. We begged our Abaji to leave, but our father was adamant. Our father believed no harm would come to him because he lived in peace, that he was favoured by the British, that they will protect us, he said. But what did they do? What they always do, pillaged us and then left. When it began, I saw through the windows of the Havili villagers running to our house full of hope that my father, the police officer, would protect us. The great gates opened for them and my father released our cattle and armed the men with rifles. We hid in the, in the Havili but could hear the roar of the attackers as they approached the house. Jai Hind, Jai Hind, Musalman Murdabad. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Da 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 can still hear it now. We had only rifles but they had machine guns. My father's so called brothers firing their machine guns at our Havili. Rifles are no match for machine guns. My courageous father, outnumbered, defiantly made his way up to the roof and started the call to prayer, what we do in times of distress. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah never finished. Women screamed as men broke into the house, screaming as they were being carried away. My mother Bibiji called Alam and I towards her. Sultan was nowhere to be seen. My father's remaining men shouting at us to run and Nikol Joyase, save yourselves, Dorjo. We ran, ran with my Bibiji through the back of the Haveli, all of us heading towards the well behind our home. And one by one, I watched girls jump in. Some silently, others crying. Some were just pushed in, too scared to do it. Better to be drowned than raped. By the time we got to the well, I saw the sunken yellows of damp skin and lips tinged petrol blue full to the brim. There was no room for us in this well of dead women. Where's Sultan? He was in the house. Sultan, have you seen my brother? Sultan, Are Sultan have you seen him? Has anyone seen my brother Sultan? I read somewhere once that when a person's heart is truly broken, they stay that age forever. In here. I wonder sometimes if I've aged. My memories are so vivid. Did my brother age? Sultan, king. That's what his name means. What good is a king without a country? What good is a dead king? For years afterwards in a strange home in Pakistan that was never really our home, my mother sat by her window waiting for her little king to come home. When I'm gone, I wonder who will ever say his name. We became refugees in a country no longer our country, waiting to be sent to a new country that wasn't home. And what did they feed us while we waited in the camps? Roti, mixed with crushed glass. Did enough of us not die already? Anger is like a crushed glass, a huge sack of crushed glass and flour you carry which tears at your insides once inside you, one you want to be free from so you can forgive, but I don't know if I'm ready to forgive. To forgive, one needs to know who to blame. The British, the Hindus, the Muslims, the Sikhs, they killed us, we killed them, but we were all one country. How much blood did we have to shed? A song plays in my head, a woman singing. Andiyaham ki yo chali, 
बाग बिचर के रह गया समझा था आसरा जिससे वो भी बेचर के रह गया समझा था आसरा जिससे वो भी बेचर के रह गया आंधिया हम की यू चली The winds of sorrow were so ferocious the orchards lost their fruit and all their shelter and protection was gone how we all cried listening to those words strangers in a new country and strangers again in 1964 when i finally came to england with my three children it wasn't as different as you might think after all we lived with the british for over 200 year years and yes there were new things to learn and the cold to get used to a new language to learn but the memory doesn't fade now when i look about me here in this royal exchange royal what a powerful word it pains me i feel our survival has come at a great cost My granddaughter shows me a picture from a long time ago and in it this wasn't a theater but a stock exchange full of merchants hundreds of them stood here arguing about the price of cotton all wanting profit while we in India just wanted to live our lives became trade we were forced to pay taxes to the raj we literally paid for our own oppression our world famous cotton linen muslin so fine you could pass it through the smallest ring our wonderful textile industry destroyed while here in england the conquerors made theirs flourish the colonizers of my country have a lot to answer for the crown rule in india history is a book with different chapters of the truth what do you remember they ask me cotton fields stretching for miles orchards pregnant with fruit under the heat of the sun alam and askari running among the budding fuchsia pink and petrol blue flowers my father waving at the gate of our grand havili with my mother at his side and i walking on the crimson red mitti of my land warm beneath my bare feet a hand outstretched towards a little boy this high who answers to the name of sultan Then we can do a clap amazing amazing stunning singing as well <laughs> I didn't practice my voice before I did that amazing. That's actually a real song that they did here from a film called Zenith sang by a very famous um singer called Noor Jahan an actress and a singer called Noor Jahan and my grandmother remembers coming across that border and all the women sitting together and hearing this song that had nothing to do with the partition but suddenly meant so much more and i think you had a response to that song when you performed it as well yes so we took this piece out to community spaces because because you know a lot of these buildings are um they're not accessible to communities of color some of them feel that they can't walk through those doors that these buildings are not for them so one of the things that we really wanted to do was take the work out to different communities and i remember going to perform that piece at a hindu temple and when i went in there were hindu and sikh women sitting at the front of this row when i started singing that song i had this incredible moment of watching these women singing the song with me and that's what this is there's it's a the stories that for years a lot of the people that went through partition could never bring to the forefront they couldn't speak about this trauma um so for me to sit there generation you know two generations later sitting in this um hindu temple with these women um who were not of the same faith as me but culturally we were all from the same place and they recognized that song and they sang it along with me it was a, it was a beautiful moment and i think that really speaks to your process which is very much about bringing silenced voices um and amplifying them and giving them this beauty and dignity mm -hmm. um 
which I know you may not consider as a process because it's so natural to you. And I think it's important that people understand process and craft may be about choosing what stories to tell and how to tell them and who you want to tell them to, not you know, very kind of sm smaller, more detailed things around craft. So I would... And 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 I think what I what really hit me most um, is that you know the what is the primary function of art is to provide a bridge of empathy and the fact that these women I did not know them but in that moment we were able to step in each other's shoes and understand each other a lot more and I think that was that was. Um, you're right, that is part of my process. And I think that's what drives me to make the work that I do, that connection with people that, you know, we can we can connect over so many universal things. All of us have felt grief, all of us have felt loss. Um, my grandmother's survival story actually, you know, gives me the tools to be, to be resilient in a way myself. And, and the stories are in our bones. But to be able to connect with people that, that are not from my background, you know, um, I think that's why I do the work that I do. Um, uh, do you know what it is there's like an internal voice in her and how I read the piece mm. and you definitely were faster than the internal voice it's so weird it's so it's so it's so weird and it was just like some striking lines that I really really enjoyed like you were saying what good is a king without a country what good is a dead king and I was just like that's such a and you just end us there do you know what I mean until we move on so it's almost like this kind of like this was this reflective thought, but also such power in that as well. And, you know, in the way you wrote it, I, I suppose in thinking about process, if, if, if writing with a community of people in mind, it, it, I, for me personally, I, I, I can't do that. I think I would, I, I would like to write from my own experiences and, and, if it speaks towards a community, then it does so. But let me talk about from my experience, so to speak. So even as you were talking to Natalie now about all these different like women, I still felt as though you kind of went in there with what you wanted to talk about, in the in the in the in the hopes that it kind of touches on these these so many different like you know facets. Because then it becomes this thing of talking about too much, too many things, and then. It just goes everywhere. You see what I mean? It's like you've touched on so many things, but I think you kind of kept to the core of what was needed. And that was important. But I also wonder what that must have been like for you to be like, okay, how do I approach this? And once you once you got there, how do I kind of maintain this narrative going through? You know, because and then adding elements of song like in there as well. You know, must have been. I don't know. I I, I think it's difficult. But for you, how 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 was that? Um, I remember, I mean, we've grown up with these stories of um, partition and especially my grandmother's story is in our bones, you know, um, we, we, we know it um, so well, but I was the only writer to perform this piece and me acting this piece actually taught me more about my great grandfather. I had this light bulb moment of, you know, thinking to myself, why did he go up on the roof and and declare this prayer. And one of the things that I tried to keep, I remember feeling very overwhelmed in this process of writing this, very overwhelmed because I was very conscious that this is not just my grandmother's story, it's lots of people's stories, but I want to stick to this one because I know this well. And through that, I then suddenly had this sense of responsibility, even if it's this one story that isn't mine, but it's it's in my ancestry. How do I keep the spirit of the piece? You know, how do I um, do I do I come away from the facts a little bit? Do I? And I remember having real um, issue over it until um, a mentor of mine just said that as long as you, as long as you there is the essence of your grandmother's story in that, then it will do what it's meant to do. Mm -hmm. So um, the, as t in, in terms of the song, um, because it was part of her story, I, I remember doing the research to find that song and putting it in there. And I think those different elements just help people to connect to the story better because you are talking about some very heavy 
you know, violence, um, this trauma. And I remember something that Toni Morrison said when she was writing Beloved, that she wants to create a piece where she's guiding the reader safely through it. And, you know, I, I feel that these stories of collective trauma sometimes can be so heavy that for me I, I wanted to I wanted to make it accessible and song is one of those things that I think helped do that. Mm. And I, it's weird because I feel like there's elements of we don't there's elements of directing mm. in the in the overall piece because you in in that directing that direction you you decided okay song here you mm. know this mm. here um we end here so there's the part of that whole process and craft yep yeah, we know about definitely end lines mm. where we kind of kick off again with a new stanza but then when it comes to stuff like song and how to fuse that with 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 a poem there's elements of directing there that that I think you know you don't kind of take enough credit for as, mm. as writers to be like oh you know here's the lens this is how I kind of see this going this is where I kind of see how this song will fit in and so yeah you go director <laughs> you go <laughs> that's what's up yeah yeah so so have so i don't know how much i mean you know i think can you guys hear me first of all yes okay great um yeah i mean we could talk about this piece for a long time there's a couple of things that i thought were really interesting in it um I thought it was beautiful that you were a kind of writer and you had a, a point in your in your writing career or practice where you you are audacious, you have audacity, you make statements, you say life is like this, you know, you say you talk about the heart, the broken heart, you talk about anger being something. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, I think there's not a lot of speculation in there, you're saying this is how it is. And I think that takes a kind of uh, emotional uh, and craft maturity, yes. you know, for writers to be able to to make statements and life like that. I was always amazed by uh, V.S. Naipaul. He does that a lot. He's able to say life is like this. This is how yes. it is. Um, lesser writers, as we as we develop, we like to say this is like this. This feels similar to this, and to sort of get the reader to to feel it. But it's a strong writer that could say, like, you know, uh, anger is like broken glass. You know, that's uh, that takes a particular maturity. So I thought that was that was remarkable in it. Um, I was also wondering about your use of language as well, though, because one of the things, I mean, as a Caribbean writer, if I write in the voice of a Caribbean person, uh, I'm aware of this political space where if I write too far in Creole, it becomes comical. So there's a way of you have to make it you have to make your characters seem intelligent, even mm. though they speak their own language, you know. Mm. And I don't know if you have that issue because the piece that you read is is like really uh, it's, it's standard English, apart from the the points mm. where you speak uh, in in the native tongue. Um, and I was wondering how you negotiate that space and whether uh, Asian or Indian writers have that particular dilemma. Mm. Yeah, I've never been asked that before, actually, because I tried to keep the piece as close to the voice of my grandmother as I can in my head, knowing that she doesn't speak English. Yeah, All right. And so, and that's why I think it comes back to the, the, the spirit and the essence of the piece. You know, I, I, I did have real dilemma of that, that how much um, can I change this dramatically and how much can I, can I kind of use language in a way that still honors her experience, but is accessible to a much wider audience. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah well, I it's about community, isn't it? I mean, I, I think it's about community and, and making a connection between people. And I think you do that in the piece. So the language is not at the forefront of it. It's, it's the story and the message where you're trying to say, you know, um, and that comes across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, Yomi and Anthony. I think that was really interesting comments and such a beautiful piece of storytelling. And as Yomi said, so many lines that just kind of jumped out and which I find going over and over in my head as well. So really beautiful writing. Um, I think we're now gonna move on to Yomi, um, if he's ready. Sure thing. Um, 
So this is titled Mannerism. Because you are property, and property doesn't speak, me at Equay Parks. That's what the youth of today should be doing more of, taking their chance and slaying it. Pierce Morgan. 15-year-old Alex Mann gets pulled from the crowd onto the Glastonbury stage, wearing a Tiago silver shirt with a bucket hat, patterned shorts, and a feeler bum bag. The nation gathers like a swarm of bees as Alex accepts Dave's invitation to rap AJ Tracy's verse in his absence. Alex Mann, all olive-skinned, gun fingers and confused with excitement, says he's fucking buzzing live on TV. And continue watching as Dave mentors him through this process of cool. Indeed, Britain loves an underdog. And so the, gra- the crowd begins to chant, Alex, Alex, oh, Tiago Silva, oh, Tiago Silva. Cheering on as they roan, as the beat drops, and he shoots out the gate. Let's fucking go. His hands, a furious blur of playing cards thrusting towards Dave, inviting him in his bout of 16s. The crowd goes wild for Alex Mann as he raps AJ Tracy's verse line for line. Three days on and my thumb is two-stepping the remote control, flicking between Alex from Glasgow, the now viral sensation, and AJ Tracy. Both are being interviewed on separate channels at the same time. I watch. Alex, well done. You took your chance, you slayed Glastonbury, I salute you. AJ, some of your other videos, it's almost like a bit of a shout out to gangs in London. AJ's body shifts in discomfort, a mannerism not felt by Alex from Glasgow, whose IG followers leapt from 90 to 100,000 in a day and still happily spitting these rap lyrics to an audience of joyful white presenters. Pierce in particular, who condemns the art form, starts dancing when rap is reflected in a different light. I watch as Champagne Papa, 44 Chopper and a Black Knight Bomber is cheered on amidst the violent undertones on breakfast television. I hear countless praise for Alex. I switch and watch countless projections on AJ. Role model, switch. Gangs, switch. Inspiration, switch. Twerking, switch. Alex Mann continues to be celebrated, reaping the rewards of words that were never his and a culture drained of its worth, while the mouth to which the lyrics belongs to is sealed, unpraised and constantly reminded of the circumstances he grew up in. Is racism still prevalent in the UK? La Republica, definitely, 100%, yes. Stormzy, sometime after, ITV News will misquote Stormzy's interview, which inadvertently draws out the itchy thumbs of white men and women. The line, UK is 100% racist, will spray pheromones in the air that can't be contained. I'll watch the nation's overcast of ignorance rain down on God-proof Big Mike. I'll watch Joe Lynham ironically tweet, stay classy to a furious Stormzy that Sunday afternoon. I'll watch, hashtag, Stormzy is a massive bellend. If you think Britain is racist, why don't you go back to Africa? I'll watch. Quit crying racism. Start shouting about the young black boys stabbed by other young black boys in London. I'll watch. Slavery was not genocide. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many damn blacks in Africa or in Britain, would there? David Starkey. A year after that, and David Starkey will have commented, you know, a bloody lot of them survived. This will loop through me. The same way Lawrence Fox will respond, you are being racist, to a call out of his privileged upbringing. The same way Aunt McPartland will constantly be forgiven and welcome back to our screens. The same way Dominic Rabb will compare taking the knee to a fictional show. The same way irritating, awful, woke, weak, manipulative will spew out of Eamon Holmes' mouth like spoilt milk about a person he has never met. The same way we will be issued an apology as the fat of their pockets shrivel to a marrow of bone. 
all of this will still echo through the lived experiences of black bodies, told to stay classy, to sit through their frustration, or to be quiet. I wonder how we do it, how we tuck it all in like that, a Diane Abbott type of superpower. I want to say these things to these people that this is how we survive behaviors we always encounter by starving them and others like them, the pleasures of such power, the pleasures of having their way. Cool. That's incredibly powerful, Yomi. Um, and I'm really struck by that use of kind of lyrical essay, quotes, you know, something that almost sounds like a social commentary, but it isn't. Um, reminds me a little bit of Claudia Rankin, obviously, you know, kind of expanding the boundaries of what poetry is about. Um, but you, you speak in the piece about the kind of heaviness of it, and it's about black bodies. And, and I wonder what it's like for you as a poet to write something like that. I mean, about the personal cost, what, what does it feel like? Um, you know, there's, there's that whole feeling of writing something and it not coming across as like preachy or talking, talking. I don't ever want to talk to someone about something that's already so prevalent. I think there are ways in which an issue can be explored through through narrative and through like this is it, the things that's been explored here ain't gonna lie you can just you're, you're a youtuber away from seeing all of it <laughs> so there's there's it's it's there but it's almost as if there's a blind eye that's been turned to it and I think there's always a process in how that is explored so for me I had to just almost draw back to all right how can I really really tell this in the form of a story as if I am talking to someone else you know um and you're right you know references with like you know from Claudia Rankin to just to other writers kind of kind of sprung to mind in terms of okay this is a good tool and also leaning on the strengths of working on a play you know and working on that kind of narrative style of lengthier writing also gave the opportunity to really explore and be be playful in in places even though it's not necessarily like a playful piece but there's elements of having to try to pull on these strands to see how can best explore all of these um these different issues because they all serve a different purpose each each scenario serves a different purpose from like a past to a relatively not so recent past to now we're now moving to the future in terms of where we are now and we're still going through the same thing just in a different year, you know? For sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you guys are saying it's not a political, well, it's not social commentary. I thought it was very accurate and very sharp social commentary. And I, I, I can hear the political, you know, um, uh, the, the, the world, the element of you making a statement on this and, you know, questioning it you know i had to actually google um this character to see if it was real and it is like <laughs> real guy. Like, yeah, okay <laughs> interesting so it was funny what stands out for me and whenever i hear it in the piece it grates on me is piers morgan and mm -hmm. i think you say it a couple two or three times and that that to me is the heart not the heart of the piece but it's one of the more interesting sonic points in the mm -hmm. piece because it conjures up a particular type of character mm -hmm. And the contrast between that character, and, you know, um, AJ Tracy, for instance, is is strong, and I think that that gives the piece a little a, a playfulness. I th I thought it was playful. I thought you you know you avoided being overtly preachy by being clever and being playful. You know, about something because really it, serious. Yeah. Even because on the actual day when that happened, I'm just like, this is it's two channels at the same time. <laughs> And you've got this person who's actual lyrics and he's been interviewed, but he's been asked completely different questions yes. from the person bizarre. that's impersonated his lyrics bizarre. and he's been praised. Yeah. It's the most bizarre piece of footage that I think I've ever witnessed. And if we could ever look at something like how privilege, how bias kind of plays a part, we're literally viewing it before our eyes yeah. on our news channels yeah. on that very morning. Yeah. And, and yeah, it's still very striking every single time I think about it, you know? Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I agree. I love what you've done. I think it's so clever the way that you've brought 
all these real live events, you know, this chronological kind of timeline, you know, that's stamped with these tweets and commentaries and like news reports. And it's all, um, you've brought it together in such a way, it's not, it doesn't feel disjointed. It just flows really well. And, you know, and there's so much in it. You're touching on racism, you're talking about white privilege, you're talking about the comparison between these two um, artists and you've just done it really well really really well I was um interested in your title mannerism does that play on words or oh so with um it's interesting because the mannerism is is it is is it's mannerism as a term in terms of like just the top mannerism like our own mannerism behavior type thing but I am equating it to the manner as in the area I believe that I believe that um black indigenous POCs, I feel like there is a different type of mannerism in which we have when we're stepping into places and in our landscapes that is very different to white people. Mm -hmm. um, like, and to, to just give you an example, for example, I could step into a nightclub with my white friend and due to my own mannerisms over time and to my circumstance of how I grew up over time, I'm immediately trying to locate the fire exits in, in the event that something happens. Whereas my white friend, he might just want to just, just go grab a drink and just get a bit, do you see what I mean? Like we're, we're operating on two different sets of codes. So, and for me, that was a very interesting, uh, that was a very interesting take because AJ Tracy in that interview, I feel like the mannerism hit him in terms of when that interview took a turn. And in all these different circumstances, we are witnessing Diane Abbott, for example, I feel like she operates on a different set of mannerisms that is definitely different to her white colleagues, for example. And I'm very, very interested in, in the research of that. And that's what my collection is looking into um, mm -hmm. fundamentally. Um, but yeah. Mm. It's like switching, you do that really well. Yes, there's a lot of code switching. And I just wanted to say, when I said it wasn't pure social commentary, I just meant that you'd used aspects of social commentary, but combined it with many other elements to produce something that kind of went beyond that, you know, it was much more crafted. Um, but absolutely stunning piece. Thank you, Yomi. And I think we're now gonna move on to the third fellow, Anthony Joseph, are you ready? I was muted, sorry. Um, yeah, so this is called Jabby the Tailor. In crew town, free town, Jabby watched the old tailor line lapels in his shed beside the water. And day by day, the needle and the trade moved closer to Jabby's hand. That pale stub of chalk pressed shut between his fingers was to mark patterns and where to cut serious cloth with scissors with jaws like young cutlass blades. In the tailor's shop where bespoke waistcoats were stitched between steam iron and ironing board, the radio hung on a nail to treble and buzz while Jabby learned to rim buttonholes by hand, tight and flawlessly neat. I found him stitching agbadas on the old Kent Road as one of two tailors working in that whirring back room at Afro Design, he was recommended. And as he showed me the shirts he had crafted to mannequins, he said, don't worry, Joseph, and I will make you something special. He measured my limbs, my neck, my hips with hard fingertips from fingerless gloves. And I will design you a good outfit myself. No pattern, no book, no scheme. Aha, now you say, fella, I know exactly what you mean. Don't worry, from jacket to trouser will be fitting perfect. And even though it took Jabby three weeks to stitch, when it finished plot, it suit and fit me fancy in truth. With epaulets and pointed colors in visco wax green and blue except the trousers, which were too exact in length, as if that were possible, and known to be shrunk when I wore them in rain, walking from the stage to backstage in Brittany. I found Jabby a month later on Peckham Rye. He had moved to a seamstress's shop in the covered market of Little Lagos and was presser footing on his wasp waste machine 
among soon finished dresses and scraps of fabric shaved from gowns and wedding cakes. Jabby, red-eyed at his engine, took a sewing pin from his mouth. Then he stood and rubbed my shoulder and said, you are my best customer. They jealous me here for my customers. They jealous my skill, but you see me here, you can find me every day, but another place, maybe I, somewhere else, I go be gone the next day. In any case, I call you when it finished, Stitch. The cloth I brought Jabby this time was psychedelic orange and brown. But three weeks gone and Jabby phone keep ringing down to flatline tone. When I pass to see if my thing done so, he say, it's nearly finished. But that man was now marking out the shirt back with chalk. He even took my address and promised to deliver the garment by hand that night, that this one was different, a special design, slightly looser, longer, and fuller in the fit, the hem cut straight, and the patterns lining up at placket and button shaft was the reason why it taken so long. Plus, he, had, he also had 20 galleys to stitch. That night, Jabby never came to Camberwell. But later next week, the thing was made and fit like he had sewn it onto my body. I had always meant for him to build me a long red kaftan with a Nehru color and billowing sleeves. Something that Richie Havens might have worn on a subway platform in old New York City in 1969. But Jabby was on Rye Lane that time and he took me by the hand. Joseph, he said, ask for me in the chicken shop and they will find me. I stop working for people now until I get my own shop. But his sunken eyes stared out from a deep narcotic hum. And the rims were waxed with dirt and black sweat. And that was the last time I saw Jabby. Amazing. Um, I'm always struck, Anthony, by the musicality. Yeah, big clap. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Yomi, I'm sorry, we didn't do the big clap for you. Let's do a clap for you. <laughs> Because I don't want any shit in the claps, you see. This is it. Yeah, I know. Oh, I you are the king. The king. Um, I'm always struck, Anthony, by the musicality in in your work because it varies so much. You have this huge range from wildly experimental through to more kind of storytelling. But it's the sound of it. I can just listen to the sound. I always imagine, it, even if you were speaking a language I didn't understand, the musicality of it just is so overwhelming. Um, it really, really kind of works almost on the level by itself. Um, but that was a beautiful, beautiful piece. Hafsa, I could see you smiling like me. We were we were really enjoying the bits of the tailor as well. It just was yeah. so vivid. It felt like, you know, I could close my eyes and, you know, if it wasn't Jabby, that's an Indian tailor yeah. making <laughs> those promises measuring that way and yeah. you know i always feel this you know it, your 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 storytelling just is just takes me away to a different place that's why i was smiling hmm. cool i i miss my tailor <laughs> i i cannot wait as soon as you just said when you say when when i saw that bad i was just like oh my god no you're doing this to me <laughs> you're doing this to me you're do and that, do you know and i think that's the power of like really really good storytelling it's like um I call it my ratatouille moments people always laugh at me like the kind of the, the, the film ratatouille the, the, the animation because when the kind of critic eats it and then it just takes him back to his childhood or whatever like that it's almost like those are the moments when I'm reading something and it raises a memory of my own tailor I'm just like kind of think about all the characteristics of my tailor and how on I will not want my tailor to leave <laughs> So if I ever heard that, I was just like, what? But it's that, it's that kind of, um, that I, I feel like it's one of the biggest aims of mine within writing is to leave lasting memories like that, you know, like to leave. And it was good to hear, and it was good to read and hear a poem that just made me smile. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's that, 
that made me smile, that made me reflect, that made that made me just want to kind of like that. I felt like it was a dance through. Like it just made yeah. me just want to have a feel good moment to call my tailor afterwards to be like, how are you? Like when <laughs> when am I bring my fabric to you next or something? Do you know what yeah. I mean? And I think yeah. I think it's a good reminder for me not to lose sight of that, not to kind of yeah. not to sit into these kind of darker kind of whatever memories but to kind of also see the light in some of these stories and 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 and, and roll with that as well so thank you very much for yeah. for sharing for yeah. sharing this piece mm. cool yeah that was amazing um i'm that was absolutely beautiful readings from all of you so thank you so much and we're just going to finish up by talking about a quote by the marvelous um bernadine evaristo the booker prize winner um, and she said recently, I don't write to educate. I write the stories that I want to. If they're political, it's because I am. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit because I think there's a lot of pressure on writers of color to write in a certain way that addresses politics head on. Um, and it's very, very prescriptive. And I know, I think you've all demonstrated that there are so many nuances and different ways of doing that. Um, and I know Anthony has said in particular that he likes his pieces to be timeless and he doesn't like to address political issues that are going on at the time. So I was wondering if how that quote, you know, what you thought about it, whether it kind of resonates with you in any way. Hafsa, I think I saw a little bit of a smile there. Yeah, well, no, I, I was just thinking that I know um, Anthony said that, you know, I don't want to write anything political, but aren't all stories political? Mm -hmm. They are. And it's just another way of saying, actually, you know, these all stories are about people living in society. You know? And for me, each of us, if we think about it, we're at a specific place, you know, where this intersection of our identity with society, we're all agents, you know, in that. So. For me to think, oh, I'm writing a political story, I don't think I even, my, my, me being a South Asian Muslim, visibly Muslim, brown woman of color, you know, I will, um, me existing in a certain place has implications. So the stories that I write will reflect that. So I don't think in my head, I think sometimes I just think to myself that if I'm writing, maybe, my when I think of the political work that we're meant to do maybe it's just that we are simply existing as ourselves you know mm -hmm. our apologetic you know our you know, unapologetic you know whole selves and telling the stories that in the ways that we want to mm -hmm. yeah I don't think I've ever put that kind of pressure on myself to be like I'm not going to write a political piece so even thinking about Anthony's piece and thinking about Javi my equivalent of Jabby is uncle. I will have an uncle Jabby. You see what I mean? And me being as, and that's my elder. So even if I see uncle Jabby and I don't, this is, I'm, I'm, and I don't acknowledge him as an uncle politically in the traditional manner, that's rude. You see what I mean? So even there's politics there. If I even address Jabby as Jabby and like, oh, did you just call her uncle Jabby without saying uncle first? Do you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's a weird kind of, it's context in terms of how you want to get, how political you want to get. So I think, you know, I just, I write my piece. If my mind is definitely leaning towards where it's leaning towards, then so it be. I don't, I don't set out to be like, I'm writing a political piece. I don't set out to be like, let me try to educate. Um, if there are, if there is something in the overall piece, I'm like, oh, let me just kind of raise this because it might kind of make people want to Google it go for it but I'm not gonna necessarily be like you need to google this do you see what I mean so even in that last piece and some of the names stuck out to Anthony for example and you googled it just to see if it was real that's job done whatever whatever should the reader take it upon themselves to do some research afterwards then so be it but that wouldn't necessarily be my aim from the gate it would just be let me just share the thought of mine mm. and hopefully that might latch on to whoever it latches on to and we just keep it moving yeah. yeah. I'm interested, Yomi, have there been points where you've thought, no, this is going to be too much for the audience? Have there been points where you've had to pull back a little bit? I've wrote some poems that others have felt like mentors have felt, no, it's, it's not, this shouldn't be the poem you go out with yet. 
not yet. For me, it wasn't necessarily an issue, but for past mentors, they felt as though, no, this is too strong. It's going to draw the wrong energy and blah, 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 blah. And I actually wonder what their thoughts would be now, to be, to be fair, because at that point, I was pretty much ready to just talk about what I wanted to talk about. But for them, I wonder what the politics were for them in thinking, no, this is not not yet, not quite yet. So were they being protective of me? Were they being aware of what this wider society will be doing? And isn't that political? And isn't that slightly me being silenced also in terms of what I wanted to talk about? So it, we can really, this can kind of be like open to God knows what, but it depends on whether as a nation, they're ready to kind of hear what the, what these poems are about. And it's not like I'm pulling it out of thin air. These are experiences. And how can you deny experiences, you know? Um, but yeah. I think it's very interesting that you've, you've had that experience of people trying to say, no, that's too much right now. Because I don't think that's just about protecting you. I think that's about protecting the status quo and saying mm. it can go so far now but we're not ready to go, for it to go any further. And I, I don't think that's your role as a poet to listen to that. Um, but also, I know, sorry, just, just to add on to that, I feel like if I didn't necessarily believe enough in me, so mm, to speak, that, then that, that might stifle me. And then I might be thinking, this is how I need to write. This is, this is, this is how I, this is how, this, if we're talking politics, this is how much I can kind of push against the grain. Exactly. Because if these, senior people that have been in this for x amount of time have been here and if they're saying no 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 then surely they must know better so yeah. i guess what is that point in which that status quo for the emerging writer they break they break that norm and kind of go forth with what they truly believe in as opposed to potentially being held back by people who ironically has their best interest and doesn't yeah. want them to be kind of blacklisted within this whole thing straight away it's such a complex one you know and obviously you're now a Joe Compton fellow you have a lot of successes under your belt you've been widely published so you know you're now in a position to kind of push back a little bit but I'm thinking of a lot of the young black poets that I meet and they bring me these poems and they're like oh I don't think I'd ever be able to publish this I don't think I'd ever be able to read this in a poetry space um and it does worry me a lot that there's still that kind of feeling um, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about your collection that will be coming out in the near future, you know, which will open up those spaces and make people realize actually you can talk about that. Mm. Yeah, 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 very much so. Yeah, um, I was just, I, I agree with, with what everyone is saying that you don't, you never set out to write a political piece. I definitely don't. I, I tend to um, transpose things. So, you know, for instance, when I, I many years ago, when I, I first came to the UK and started writing and started really trying to figure out maturing and understanding what it meant, what blackness was about. And I went into this whole phase where I was reading a lot of, you know, a lot of black, I, I don't know, a lot of Fanon and stuff like that, trying to figure out what it meant. What, what does it actually mean to be black, you know? And that search, instead of writing directly about, you know, um, contemporary world and what it means to be black, yeah, it, it turned out to be a science fiction novel. And that was the vehicle with which I could choose to explore what blackness was about and have this character who was like a melanin smuggler and selling bootleg melanin and going through the desert to find melanin. And that became a metaphor for black people searching for, 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 for themselves and UFOs and, you know, the whole thing. Um, so it was a transposition of the, of, the, of the real world into a futuristic world in order to understand what's going on now, you know. Um, so that's what I do. That's how I do it. I, I can't, I guess, like, like, like Hafsa and like Yumi, you know, you never want to, you're not a politician. We're not politicians. We're not here to espouse policy. And, and rhetoric we're poets and artists so you know we in the same way a, a painting is not a tree you know your poem is is not politic your poem is, is an art you know is an art so that's how i look at it uh but you know i do think as hafsa says you know writing is a political act you know it's a political act it always is a political act because politics is nothing but the study of power the study of of 
people that have power and people that don't, you know, it's what it's about. So, yeah, it's, you're always within a political space as a poet, you know. Anthony, can you just tell us the name of that book of yours? Because it's one of my favorites. It was called The African Origins of UFOs. And is it is it still available? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's actually just been um, translated into Polish. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Getting a lot of good, uh, a lot of good reviews for the Polish translation. But yeah, it's still it, well. It's you can get it. Um, I think Sol that published it. They 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 are out of business now in terms of um, repressing stuff like that. Um, I have the rights to it, so I'm looking. I'm talking about getting it republished, but um, you can get it still. Yeah. Second, yeah. Has it been published in the states? Because I think um, no, great. no, it hasn't. It hasn't. It hasn't. But mind you, the first, the, I mean, the first excerpt from it was, the, an excerpt from it was published in a book that came out in 2000 called Dark Matter, which was the first sort of anthology of, of so-called black science fiction and speculative writing. It was published by Warner Books. So, yeah. And when you first came out with it, um, because it is extremely experimental as well, I mean, it's, it's quite an amazing piece. Um, how did people respond to that? Because it was quite a different way of looking at blackness and looking at poetry and looking at writing. Um, did you get a good reception or were people a little bit like, we're not quite sure what's going on here? I got a good reception, but I got a good reception mainly from the US, mm -hmm. which was interesting. You know, a lot of academics in the US started inviting me over to do residencies and to do lectures and readings and whatever so that happened a lot not so much in the uk you know um but yeah the response to it was good and it's 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 still it's seen i mean i don't like, i don't want to boast but it's 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 part of the canon of, of afrofuturism now. it's part of that you know so yeah and it's interesting because all three of you in different ways are kind of opening up new spaces um within poetry and within writing um, and, you know, so all of you are kind of like the first, the pioneers in some way to be doing what you're doing. And I think the responses to that are quite interesting, mm -hmm. that it maybe takes a little bit of time because you are looking at these topics, which people have decided should be written about in a certain way and doing it in a very different way. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's, that's a really, really interesting thing as well. But obviously, each of you, you know, you know... I mean, it doesn't sound like any of you have any doubt about your process and what you want to do, and you're just kind of getting on with it. I mean, have so do you ever think about the critical response? Is that something that you ever consider while you're writing? Say that again, sorry, Natalie. Do you ever think about the critical response? So, you know, what are the experts, the critics going to say about this piece? Is that something that you, you think about? Um, I think if I did do that, it would really stunt my writing. So it's one of the things that I try and I try and not think about. I would much rather just throw myself into the process and trust that um, trust the writing that will come. Um, I yeah, I, I try not to go down that route. I, I think that that would I would end up censoring myself if I did that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's a big misconception that people think that craft is something that is, you know, you sit and you kind of think about the craft separate to the poetry in some ways, or the form. Uh, Whereas that this thing of just moving with the process and giving yourself over to it fully. Yomi, do you ever think about, oh my goodness, I wonder how people are going to respond to this? Is it going to be too much for certain people? Is it Does that kind of enter your thinking when you're making choices or not so much? Yeah. Yeah, 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 relying upon to to say that I don't think about that, you know, because I feel like some of the things or issues that I'm talking about, it's 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 holding a mirror up a lot of the times, you know, and and it's it's I've always said I don't want to ever enter a piece of work with no cape on my back, like like it's trying to save the day. Mm -hmm. Um but I do want to raise a conversation. I feel like the, 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 there are some beautiful pieces of work and music that I've listened to over time that that raise really good discussions. Um, and I'd love to be a contributor in that whole process as well. And how people take to it, I have no idea. I and I guess that's the next stage of my own transition. So 
it always throws me every single time you read someone like Anthony's bio, for example. I'm just like, what, seven albums? What? How many books? I'm just like, what, what, what? But that's like how many times of like going through that same process of someone getting oh. used to, okay, you know, book is released, album is released, followed by reviews. And then I think every single time that same process happens, skin gets a bit tougher in terms of knowing, okay, this is what you prep for. Maybe for the first book or the first album, you're going to try your best to stay off Google to kind of <laughs> try your best to close off the phones, to look away from stuff. But by book four, by album eight, you freely go into there because you know what this process is like. And I think I'm excited at the thoughts that I'm embarking on that journey. And I'm looking like I've done it with Colt in terms of my first play. I read some reviews on there. Good. I read some that were a bit confusing, whatever. By the second one, I'm better equipped to know how to go in. So I think it grows. It grows as the writing grows and as I grow. And, and I'm excited at the thoughts of that. Yeah, Anthony, I think that's a really interesting point because obviously you've written a large number of collections. I personally think you should have been given a lot more awards than you were, um, although you received a lot of critical acclaim. I think you should have had even more. I think you're one of the most significant poets that we've got in Britain. Um, and I'd like to see your name talked about a lot more. Um, the same happened with Roger Robinson until his recent collection. Yeah. And then it was that everybody suddenly realized um, is that at all difficult? Do you look at the reviews? Do you think, right, maybe I'll try something different? Um, because it feels like you just carry on doing exactly what you want to do, which is amazing. Yeah, I, I don't think of, um, I mean, I don't, I do like Yomi, I guess. I do think of how the work is going to be received, but I don't think of critics. I think of readers. <laughs> And I think of that that dialogue. I think it's important to have a dialogue uh, between your work and the reader, the people that's go they're going to read the work, which might be a critic or might not be. But when I write, I don't have a critic. Uh, I don't think of a crit of what uh, what is a critic going to say about this. I think about what is the reader going to say about this. What is a Trinidadian high school student, or what is someone uh, you know a a, prof a a friend of mine in Oxford? What are they going to think? You know. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that your reader is a, a huge percentage of your work, you know, they, how they respond and what they have to imagine and fill out creates the work, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, but in terms of just going ahead, yeah, I mean, you know, I remember watching this interview with Prince and it was like he was talking about, he was talking to somebody on a sofa, some chat show. And the guy was saying, you know, how do you measure success? You know, you've had this, you've done that. How do you measure, measure success? And Princess said, when I do the work, when I finish it, it's success. I don't need any, I've successfully done the work. I don't need any other acclaim beyond that, you know? So for me, it's about doing the work. And um, I, see, I see what I do as one body of work. One, so even though there's all these books and there's all these... Uh, um, albums or whatever for me it's i'm trying to we create one body of work and then we leave and the body of work stays there and it's a body of work so it, yeah i see it as a body of work and i just want to get to the, the point where i've completed my body of work and that's it you know um yeah but it is a lonely space sometimes when you are working and it's very you know very it's not your thing to go out there pushing yourself and you know and you got to wait for for this and wait for that you know it's, it's part of the, part of the process for a lot of people you know um i remember talking to kemal braithwaite about this and um i was saying you know you've done so much how do you keep going and stuff like that how do you you know um and he was saying you know i was he was saying to me the same sort of thing he was saying you know you should you should get a lot more claim you should get your work more out there you should do this you should do that but then he said to me i'm terrible at it i'm terrible at going out there and pushing myself, you know, he just couldn't do it. He just, it just wasn't him, you know. But when you look at his body of work, it's so profound, you know. So you just do the work. Well, I think that's a beautiful place to end as well. So thank you, all three of you. I think that was a really, really interesting and inspiring conversation. Um, and I think it's going to be useful to a lot of writers who are coming up as well. So thank you so much. And I think that ends today's round table. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. <laughs>